Welcome to the Rotor World Basketball Show. Dan Titus, Raphael Johnson, and Von Delzo are here to join you and talking about the NBA playoffs. I missed last week, so I'm thankful that these two gentlemen held it down, hopefully bragged about some winning some fantasy championships, which I have heard nothing about so far. But if you are watching, that's good news. That means you are not banned from this show. But who is banned, Raphael? Dante Porter, baby, from the NBA. Yeah. Let's go. Great decision. Great decision. Yeah. Um, I It kind of surprised me. Like, I knew – I had a feeling they would come down hard on him just because of, you know, you can't have situations where the integrity of your game is questioned. They already do as it is with, like, officiating and stuff like that. But I didn't think they would set a marker like this. I think when we discussed it when the news dropped a few weeks ago, it was more about the lack of trust in the locker room. Like, I thought that would be the reason why he wouldn't play again, not the league, like, moving to actually ban him. But I think what I would say is that none of this really matters much if there isn't regulation from like the federal government because the leagues can do whatever they want. But until you have that type of regulation so that everyone has a, a standard set of rules that they have to abide by, you're going to continue to have situations like this, I fear. Yeah, that's a really good point too as well. Um, this is definitely going to be something to monitor now because we've seen – College program is being under investigation. We're mm -hmm. seeing players under investigation, obviously. Not to the same degree, but at some point this year, Shohei Otani and MLB could be shaking his boots as well if they're going to yeah. ban someone after he just got a 10-year deal worth, what, half a billion dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Dan, what's your opinion on the Jonte Porter nonsense? I, I think it set a good precedence going forward. I mean, uh, it sounds like Raph is, is convinced that it might happen again, and maybe across sports, right? But – yeah. I think Adam Silver sent a pretty significant message here. So unless you want to risk your career over $21,000, you know, that, <laughs> you're going to risk, you're going to risk getting kicked out of the leagues. And yeah. I don't know that that was worth it for Jonte Porter. Fortunately, his brother is stupid rich. So, you know, I'm sure he'll help him out, but you know, the average NBA player, you know, I don't know if you want to risk your career over a couple of parlays. Um, definitely concerning that he's betting on his own team and, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those things I think was bound to happen. And fortunately, you know, I think it happened earlier rather than later. You know, there could have been this conspiracy involving a whole bunch of players. Like, I think the fact that the regulators and the uh, sports books work together to kind of handle this situation internally pretty quickly, um, I, I think just speaks to the volume of how serious this was and how much they wanted to get in front of it. So um, hopefully we get less of this. You know, I think it's going to be a hard it's going to be a hard thing to do because literally every program you watch is talking about betting. So like it's yeah. ingrained in what we do now. Mm -hmm. So how you walk that line and, and be responsible about, it, I think rap was exactly right with, there has to be some regulatory compliance changes going forward to kind of prevent it from, you know, just ruining sport in general. Yeah. It's actually far more common occurrence than most people would actually think too right now. I mean, there's been cases over the last two years, NHL player was spending half the season last year for betting on other sports outside of NHL. We had uh, two PGA golfers last year as well. Can't forget about Calvin Ridley. Uh, Kayshawn Butte, wide receiver for the Patriots, rookie, illegal betting at LSU. Um, mm -hmm. So this is very common occurrence. And as you mentioned, Dan, and I, I mean, as someone who does sports betting for NBC, I always have to be cognizant of how much you bet, how much you see it on TV, not being bored in betting, because it is a could be a problem for people moving forward and not just the everyday person the players as well because they feel like they should be making more money you're making enough money by the way guys <laughs> yeah. right but, all right uh moving on to something that uh i don't know i guess it's still just as sad actually um zion williamson i mean he had the 40 piece then he got hurt uh hamstring injury he's gonna miss the game against the king so rafael obviously very disappointing to see Zion finally lived up to that potential and one of the biggest moments of arguably of his career, and then it's gone and they lose. Yeah. yeah, he's out at least two weeks from what I saw in the report. So we're looking at a situation where they may need to get to the second round uh, minimum. You know, when you think about the ramp-up process and also his medical history, I don't think it's going to be a case where they try to rush him back out on the court. So it's a huge loss for the Pelicans. Um Maybe this gives the Kings a chance on Friday because they went 0-5 against the Pelicans during the regular season. Average margin of defeat, 19 points. Like, they weren't even close. 
a lot in those games. So to take a player of Zion's caliber off the floor, you have Brandon Ingram still under a minutes restriction, 25 minutes from only two more than he played on, on Sunday. So got him, CJ McCollum really struggled last night, man. It, unless Trey Murphy has something up his, you know, up his sleeve here, the Pelicans may be in trouble you know, for that game against the Kings, especially how good Keegan Murray and um, Keon, Keon Ellis looked last night. Okay. Yeah, Keegan Murray dropping 32 points. He was amazing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, McCollum entered the fourth quarter. He was 2 of 12 from the field. Brandon Ingram uh, didn't even play down the stretch. Looked like he may not have been in game shape or something then after having a great yeah, he's first quarter. he's still restricted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, that was – and you could see on his face – the disappointment mm-hmm. from not being in the game there when yeah. they really need that offense because it was only McCollum or Trey Murphy from the smoothie logo uh, hitting <laughs> shots. So uh, what's your opinion, Dan, on the Pelicans? And you think the Ken- Kings win on on Friday? Pelicans are in trouble. Um, I was fortunate to go to the game last night for the Kings, and uh, that stadium was rocking. And I'll tell you what, the Kings know that they were 0-5 against the Pelicans this year, and they're they're out for blood. And I think that the first step on their journey to kind of go to that next level was taking down the dynasty that is the Warriors. And the way Keegan Murray plays went, the way that the Kings look when Keegan Murray is aggressive, it's a different squad. And now you insert mm-hmm. Keon Ellis in there, a guy that had six stocks, made threes, was a menace on, on Steph Curry all night. And I think it's more of a testament to Mike Brown's game planning and the way that he took away Steph Curry and the threats and making people like Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody beat you. I mean, Clay Thompson had one of the worst games of his career, the worst game of his career. Um, Mm. But I think it's more so about this is actually a moment where everyone was kind of losing faith in the Kings, where it's actually just working out in a really good way for Mm -hmm. them in terms of a path to the play to the playoffs, um, especially with Zion getting hurt. I probably would have felt differently if Zion was playing the way that he was in that Lakers game before sustaining that injury. But without Zion in there. I feel like they could do the same thing to CJ McCollum or to, to CJ McCollum that they just did to Steph Curry. Yeah. And if the Kings are making their threes, they're a different team. Add in Fox and Sabonis. I think this is going to be uh they're, they're going to get to the playoffs. I think this, the Pelicans, unfortunately, they just didn't stay healthy at the end of the season. I think this is going to be the end of it. I think it all really worked out too for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Are you getting the Kings or the Pelicans opposed to the Lakers? Mm-hmm. Raphael? I love to say the Pelicans have lost their last six home games too. So the Ooh. home court advantage on Friday may not be what we would expect it to be in a game of this magnitude, but you know, they've got, good, they've got good fans down there. Hopefully they step up, kind of put a little bit, you know, under the wings of those players. They're certainly going to need it. Yeah. I, I will say um, from watching the game in person, I did feel like the crowd felt like they lost even when they were in the game. Uh, <laughs> late in that game, and uh, okay. just probably because Zion was not on the floor, Ingram was not mm-hmm. on the floor. Um, you know, and CJ McCollum is your next best scoring option, he's not giving you much of anything at that point. So, yeah, I would say all hands on deck for the Kings. Uh, a good friend of mine and another great NBA capper, his name is Jay Money. He once he says, When teams in this position, it's called the kitchen sink game, they throw mm-hmm. everything at you, including the kitchen sink, because they've lost every game, and this is the, the game that defines their season. So I do expect the Kings to come out hot uh, to start that game. Uh, but as we mentioned, the Lakers, uh, getting messed up against the Nuggets, I thought for sure LeBron James would say, we'd rather go through the Thunder uh, in the playoffs, but he's going to the Mile House City, Raphael. So, I mean, Nuggets in five? That's what I got to say. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think LeBron has to be the best player on the floor for them to have a chance to win this series. Um Anthony Davis, I think him playing 40 minutes last night is encouraging when you remember the back spasms on Sunday. But that being said, he's never had an answer for Nikola Jokic. And I don't think the Lakers have an answer for Jamal Murray either. Now, getting Gabe Vincent back can help, but he's still kind of restricted in terms of how much he can play. So, yeah, I, I think Denver in a gentleman's sweep is kind of is a fair assessment of that series for me personally. Yeah, it's uh, hard for me to imagine this Lakers team finally turning it around in the postseason. But D'Lo has been playing amazing on Austin Reeves. Anthony Davis, most games played on his career, Dan. So uh, do you like the Lakers to win a game or two here? Can they win the series? I think they can get two. I don't think they're going to win the series. I have the Nuggets as the, the 
the favorite to win it all. I mean, mm -hmm. I just don't see when it's all said and done, like who's they're going to need some some variables here to step up. And I just don't know that outside of A.D. and LeBron and maybe Austin Reeves, because, like, you know, D'Angelo Russell is going to have those swing games of mm -hmm. being great and then being horrible. So mm -hmm. um, I just don't think they have enough firepower to do it. This team limped to the playing tournament. The Nuggets have been solid all year. They're healthy, more importantly. So I don't think anyone's the, the Lakers aren't. If I'm the Lakers, I actually feel better about playing them now because, like, I don't know what the health would look like later on the season yeah, if you yeah. got to go a couple of rounds. So mm -hmm. I think if they want – this is the matchup they want. Like, they're going to have to go all in right now. And I don't think it'll be enough, but I think it'll at least be entertaining basketball to watch. Yeah, the Nuggets did sweep the Lakers this year in all three games too. So another situation where, you know, the Lakers in game one are probably going to come out and do everything possible to get that victory because last thing they wanted is to go down, back to L.A. down 0-2 against the Nuggets, a team that can't win on the road as well. And uh, was tied for the top seed and best record, but the Thunder, baby, they keep on mm -hmm. finding ways to make us happy because uh, they are goats. But uh, you know who else is a goat, guys? Nelly Corda. She's going to continue her hot streak and fend off the LPGA's finest at the Chevron Championship. You can tune in this week for the first major of the season only on NBC and Peacock. That's 3 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. And uh, you kind of mentioned this, Dan. Clay Thompson had his worst game ever. It was so bad that your boy, who was laying on the couch ready for sleep, said, let me go ahead and live bet this under six and a half and under five and a half points. Uh, went to bed, woke up, and saw a still a zero piece and said, woo, no sweat bet. Love to see that. The dynasty's <laughs> over, Dan. Yes or no? I think so. Um, so I, I attended the post game presser and, you know, obviously the questions were asked to Steph, to Draymond, like, what does the future hold? And it sounds like they were optimistic, but I think that that's just, you know, the emotions of coming off of, of a disappointing loss and ultimately a disappointing season where they didn't achieve their goal. Clay Thompson had his moments this year. I just don't know that it's enough to warrant giving him the contract that his career deserves you know he could definitely get a bag somewhere else someone that will pay for a sharpshooter like him even though he's at the the different side of his career he can still help a team win um so i think it's going to be a, a very interesting time for the warriors they have to get younger and i think jonathan kaminga and moses moody are two people that it makes sense to resign um they just i just couldn't help but think like this team looked flat they couldn't adjust just from the onset, man, the the Kings just had their number. And, and I feel like that's going to be the trend if they continue to try to keep this this trio together. Um, yeah, they had some really good things to say, but it sounded very much like the end of the road. Like you know, I could hear like the song in the background, just kind of like very, very <laughs> monotone. It's like, oh, let's just send them off gracefully, even though it didn't end this well. But it's kind of fitting, right? Like dynasties always come yeah. crashing down, right? And it's I feel like it was... It was going to be something. Is there Draymond's going to get ejected, or Clay was going to be a disaster, or Steph wouldn't show up? And unfortunately, it was Clay, man. I didn't think it would be that bad, but yeah, it was. It was rough. I believe the song you're referencing is "Closing Time," Dan. Closing um, time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I will say I did love what I saw from Moses Moody and Kaminga in the second quarter yeah. of that Warriors game. Um, specifically that first half comeback for the Warriors. Steph Curry almost capped it off with an insane three-point, half-court three-point shot. Uh, but, yeah, they never really got it going outside of Draymond Green uh, in the first quarter. So, Rafael, same question to you. I mean, does Clay get a contract with the Warriors? He goes somewhere else. This dynasty is over, you're assuming? Yeah, I think, if anything, that 20 – was it 2022 and they won the title? That may have been fool's gold because they – you know, it gave them the impetus to kind of keep everything together. Right after that, Jordan Poole got his contract that they were able to eventually get off of. If they don't win that title, make that deep run of the finals even, you know, maybe some different decisions are made regarding the finances. But, yeah, it was a tough way to watch Clay go out. You know, I know they, they may not have the biggest fans amongst other teams in the NBA given how, you know, how much joy they took in beating other teams throughout this run. But it's like, you don't want to see someone go out like that. But like Dan said, dynasties very rarely end smoothly. You know, it's either injuries, guys falling off, you know, firings, releases, all that stuff. They don't end 
pretty, you know, even if you look at like history books, like, you know, the Roman dynasty, stuff like that, those don't end pretty <laughs> either. So it's like you knew something was going to happen, just a matter of how. Um, I don't, I wonder what his asking price is going to be. I know they reported during the game it's decreased some. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we kind of know, you know, <laughs> given how he played, yeah, it's going to drop, but it's like, is someone going to come by with an offer that he can't refuse from a financial standpoint, even if from a basketball standpoint, it doesn't make sense. They really need to clear up space for Kuminga and Moody, both extension eligible this summer. Brandon Pajemski needs room. Um, Trace Jackson Davis, completely different position. He's another guy who's going to need room in terms of minutes to see what they have there because these new guys need to have a chance to show what they can bring to that franchise. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Clay Thompson, second fewest points scored uh, since his rookie season, lowest mm -hmm. since uh, second year in the league. So certainly everything's come crashing down for them. Uh, and I love the, uh, the Roman Empire shout out to uh, true stuff. History buff over here. What's up, Dan? <laughs> Assuming the Mavericks or the Orlando Magic have the cap space in the room, I feel like those mm. are two teams that would be yeah. great fits for Clay, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely the Mavericks. And I, he's he's going to have suitors. Like I, you don't have to oh, ask yeah. them to do much at this point, right? Like I just need you to yeah. hit a, spread the ball, catch that on the wing, fire it away. And so, like I feel like that's the thing is like if he's willing to take a discount with the Warriors. How much is that discount to try to, mm -hmm. you know, just, Hey, I want to retire here. I love it. I get it. But I think it's actually pretty interesting if he joined like a Luca and Kyrie or an emerging Paolo Bancaro, Franz mm -hmm. Wagner, like add a veteran presence, winning presence to that locker room. Like, I think that'd be a pretty cool thing to see at the second stage of his career. Do you have any ideas on spots where you would like him to land Raphael? I could see him uh, with the think... Grizzlies potentially. I don't think so. I think I, – I don't know about Memphis, but I would say Orlando. I think that's a good spot because when you have Ben Carroll and Wagner, there have been some turnover issues with Paolo, but I don't know – with those two playmakers, I don't know if they need a traditional point guard in that lineup. And in terms of defensive assignments, you've got Jalen Suggs, who's been an absolute pest throughout this season. You know, obviously with Orlando, the main question with that franchise is the health. Now, if you can keep Suggs, Clay, and Jonathan Isaac healthy, that team would be a nightmare defensively. Like, come on, man. We, we watched, I think, who is it? Jonathan Isaac, like, thoroughly shut down this week in a game. Like, he's, it's ridiculous what he can do. Um, but again, the health factor. But I think Orlando, they need three point shooting in a big way. And if they can get Clay there, I don't think they're going to overpay too much, but if they can get him on that roster, get a credible three-point shooter, that may be the team that makes an Oklahoma City like jump next year. Yeah, Ooh, that's a great point too. Like, yeah, mm. I mean Gary Harris is your best three-point shooter in Orlando as a guard. And he's thirty-six. And he can't stay healthy people. either. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I mean, you definitely need something else there. And I love how mm. uh, our producer Adam always thinking on the bright side of things. No income state <laughs> tax in Texas or Florida. Obviously, yeah. those are great landing spots for NBA players who uh, pay insane amounts of tax uh, night in and night out. But we spoke a little bit about Keegan Murray. Uh, I want to get your guys' opinion on him for fantasy next year because this is a fantasy show, not just an NBA playoff show yeah. now. Mm -hmm. uh, Raphael, where are you putting him next year, especially after his 32-point night? I think he's still a middle-round guy for me. Like I don't know if he can use like a, a back end of like the top 50. But I think just outside of that range would be fair for him because, as Dan said, when he's aggressive, the equation changes for that team. And I think going into year three, I would expect the aggression to not be an issue for him. Not that it was a, a, a severe issue for him this year, but when you're playing off of Fox and Sabonis, two ball dominant playmakers in their own right, it can be kind of difficult to get in where you fit in, so to speak. So I think year three, I think I'm looking at him like just outside the top 50 personally. Man, does he uh, get anywhere near top 50 for you? Big jump. Yeah, I was thinking top 60. I mean, he was uh, ninth round value in terms of the preseason where he was drafted last year. Mm -hmm. I could see him moving up to at least the sixth round. Like if all things, uh, all things considered, 
I feel like he's the player that's going to take the most substantial jump. Maybe Keon Ellis, depending mm-hmm. on how much what that situation is, and, and Kevin Herter. But I think if this is a thing that might stick, like I feel like Keegan Murray could be one of those breakout playoff performers, assuming they beat the Pelicans. We could see him on center stage, like, yo, this guy. We see why mm-hmm. this guy was a high pick in the draft. What was he number four pick in the draft? I think. Yes. Um, yeah. Sharpshooter. So man. the when in. The rebounding, the defense, like it could all come together for him. He could easily be a top 50, top 60 guy. So, like, I think it sounds rich just based off where he was drafted this year, but like, I could see him taking that next leap uh, going to next season, which will be year three, which tends to be, mm-hmm. you know, one of those tipping off points for, for a lot of players. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I was going to say, um, not that I am the fantasy expert by any means when it comes to ranking players, but Keegan Murray seems like a sixth to seventh round type of player with terms of name and his production, but. I could see him being a breakout candidate next year too, as well. And I mean, they have so many guards there, but the Kevin Hart, Hever, Kevin Harder situation is definitely appealing too, with uh, the potential for him to make a jump if he's not there. Malik Monk, Keon Ellis, there's a lot of guys behind Darren Fox. But really, the big part of the show, which I want to talk about, is Dan Joel Embiid and the Sixers, eight straight dubs. Are they going to beat the Heat or what? I think they will, man. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a defensive battle scrappy playoff jimmy i don't know if he's ready to transition from emo jimmy to playoff jimmy but like i think it's <laughs> it's time for him to show up um i do think it's going to hurt the heat though without terry rogier um that that is going to be a, a considerable three-point threat that they're going to need one of the things that was huge for the miami heat last year was their three-point variance like they just hit everything for the first few rounds and then you know they kind of ran out of mojo but i think that the sixers are the most dangerous team at the lower seeds right now in the playoffs. And if they can get past the heat tonight, bring on the Knicks. And oh, I can't boy. wait to talk to go. rap about it. <laughs> it's gonna because it's already on and popping, man. Yeah. They don't want to see the Sixers. They don't want to see the Sixers. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. Like all I'm saying is this of the three teams that had a chance to win the two seed on Sunday, which one didn't pull the plug and continue to compete? Exactly. The Knicks. It will be difficult. Like you've got a reigning MVP. Tyrese Maxey's probably going to win most improved player. Kelly Oubre has been really good for them this year. Uh, I think for that reason, they're just going to have too much for Miami. You know, no Terry Rozier. You know, this is probably where the Max Struess and Gabe Vincent absences, you know, them moving on kind of hurt Miami just because of three point shooting. Duncan Robinson. I think he's on track to play, but he's had back issues as well. Um, getting to have a hero back certainly helps, but I don't think they have enough for Philly. I think Sixers Knicks would be a really good series. I don't agree with this idea that Philly is just going to walk through them and have a path to the conference finals. Though um, it'll be difficult, but I think it's I think it's a series that's going to go the distance for sure, um, just because of how competitive those teams are. But yeah, I I don't think I wouldn't say the Knicks would not be stressed. But they're not going to be walking there fearful of being knocked off either. That team's just – their mindset is not geared that way. Yeah, I think this could be potentially the best series of the first round, uh, yeah. Sixers versus Knicks. And I think Joel Embiid and Jalen Brunson over on points will be on my card like every single night mm-hmm. that they play because those stars have just been phenomenal all season long. So what's the uh, prediction then for if your two teams play? Uh, who wins and how many games? Dan, I'll let you start. Uh, I would say Sixers and s- Sixers and six. Knicks and seven. <laughs> <laughs> when active, Joel Embiid is sixteen and three versus the Knicks, man. And I will say, DeAnthony Melton's coming back. That is huge. Uh, if this is all huge, this is all how many predicated minutes? Wait, on- ho, ho, ho. <laughs> how many minutes do you really think you're gonna get out of Melton at this point? Because I don't even think they know. Hey, if you all think I know 15, is it's another body. We got to get past the heat minutes first. is going to be enough. We got to get past the heat, past the heat first. But if we see Jalen Brunson in the second round, in the first round, trust me, we're going to be throwing everything. The kitchen sink. We're going to be throwing the kitchen sink at Jalen <laughs> Brunson because y'all don't have anybody that's reliable outside of Dante DiVincenzo to score the ball. Please put Kyle Lowry on Jalen Brunson. And the <laughs> Put, and no, Kelly put, put put Kyle on him. They're gonna ban Jalen from all Villanova functions after what he does. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
<laughs> is it Raphael? Is Kyle Lowry even playing by game five of the series? Like, he might fall out of rotation. He might have a he'll hamstring. Be out, he'll pool. be out there. That's possible. He'll be out there. Now, will he be effective? Will they? We'll see. But like, like Dan said, they are going to throw different options at him. But it that man's played at an MVP level this year. I, I don't think it'll be You're enough. Wrong. You're not wrong. Yeah, Jalen Brunson uh, never once brought up for a top three or top five MVP player yeah. outside of a few weeks this season. And I mean, some point we're going to have to recognize this man for what he is. Uh, I mean, getting the Knicks to a two seed has certainly been amazing. And uh, Joel Embiid as well, his season cut short almost 35 points per game. So we're getting the two most exciting players potentially if your Sixers continue to heat hot streak yeah. and beat the Miami Heat. Uh, which is no easy a- ask this time of year, as we know. But Miami, not the same team as years past. I guess because we have to talk about them. Uh, my Chicago Bulls taking on the Atlanta Hawks. I'm more wearing the North jersey. It's Trey Young because I expect Trey Young. To play, uh, yeah. Oh, and you got the rod, man. Look at the worst. <laughs> I love this. Uh, personally, I don't care who wins this game. I hope the Bulls lose. Um, I had the Bulls under 38 and a half wins. They finished with 39. Uh, so yeah. I don't care what happens then the rest of the season. Uh, Dan, go ahead. You start. Yeah, I got the Hawks here, man. I think the world is on the Bulls just because, you know, the, the Hawks are without Jalen Johnson and Yakun Kongwo. I mean, the the host of injuries that they have. But and if you look at the the playing record, I think road road on the road. Yeah, I think road opponents are like seven and 13 straight up in playing games. So like the trends don't lean towards the Hawks, but like I can't help but think the Bulls are just a slower paced team. And when you don't have, um, you know, such reliance like Jalen Johnson in your lineup, you got to play fast. And I think that's what mm-hmm. the, the Hawks are going to do. They're going to try to bomb them from three. The Hawks or the Bulls were bottom three in threes, opponent threes made and attempted this season. So I would say to Bogdanovich, DeJounte Murray, Trey Young, just get after it. And if they can score more points, they'll win the game. Because we know that the Hawks defense is <laughs> terrible. Absolutely terrible. Bro. Absolutely yes. terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> if they can score more points, they win the game. No, I'm saying yeah. like like if they like, like they, actually it, like put points talk, on the okay. board. Like okay. they gotta out, right. you know what I'm saying? Like so you're yeah. talking about the number of overall points, not just the basic if they score more <laughs> points. <laughs> Right. If they if they have more possessions, yeah, if they you, get more okay, possessions they're, yeah. and they win yeah. the three point variance, they will win the game. All right, I they will you. not win the game on their defensive end because they have no I defense. You. I got you. I, I just <laughs> do I make to make sure I'm not trying to disrespect my man here. I'm, you know, make that clear. But yeah, but um, yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think that's a good point in terms of the possession game. You know, how many possessions will there be? You get into a tight game. I know that we've seen Trey and DeJounte make things happen in tight games late. I don't want to have to deal with DeMar DeRozan in that situation. So I think the faster they play, the more points, possessions they get up, the better it will be for Atlanta. As our friend Noah Rubin likes to remind me, the Hawks are undefeated all time in a play-in tournament. Um, (laughs) It matters, but it's, it's one of those things. It's like, how proud of this should you be? Because, you know, I think they're like three, either three or four and no all time in the play in tournament. It's like, yeah, you're good in that game, but why are you there so often? So, um, <laughs> Ask yeah, LeBron, but I, I, yeah, the guy that hate, I, they hated the whole thing and he finds himself in it now. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> preserving your legacy, bro. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. you slandered the whole idea. Now, look at you. Yeah, yeah, I think for Chicago, not having Andre Drummond, if he can't play, can be an issue as well. Just because you have him out there, he can possibly exploit the fact that they don't have Okongwu coming off the bench. Like Bruno Fernando has had his moments, but I would take Drummond over him every day of the week. So if he's either limited or can't play, that would be a concern, even if he's only playing like 15, 18 minutes, just because of what he can do on the on the glass for the Bulls. So yeah. I think I'm going to go with Chicago because they're at home, but this isn't really a game that excites me too much, to be honest with you. Yeah, me neither, as a Bulls fan. And it's outside of DeMar DeRozan and Kobe White, I don't really see the scoring yeah. options for Chicago being enough in this one. Um, you know, you got your 
Tory Craig's of the world um, that are really trying to step up right now, and I have the sumo these type of guys. So I, I'm not excited to be watching this game in general either. I'll be sticking into the Sixers Heat game for sure. <laughs> um, but uh, whoever is the uh, the eight seed here in the East, um, I definitely think is a fadeable opponent, whether it's Hawks, Bulls, or the Miami Heat. Um, man, go ahead, Dan. One thing, um, similar to the situation with the Lakers facing the Nuggets, I almost feel like if the Sixers lose this game and they got to face the the Celtics, they're going to want to do it right away, right? Yeah. Because, Mm -hmm. like, you don't know that – you can't bank on Joel Embiid lasting through the playoffs same way. Like, if you're going to go for it, get it over with now. Let's do this. Y'all own us, so let's get it out Mm -hmm. the way. So if the Sixers do happen to lose, as much as I don't want to see them play against the Boston Celtics because it could be an early exit, I feel like it has to happen. Like, that. that's what – that's the smoke you want in the first round. I think it would be good for Boston, though, um, because I think seeing Philadelphia in the first round would probably keep them on task because yeah. they did lead the they league in wins them. by a large margin, but we've seen it before where they have moments where they basically trick off games because they go one-on-one down the stretch instead of continuing you know, with that offensive system that's been so successful for them. So, yeah, I, I can understand Philadelphia – Wanting maybe not really wanting to see Boston early, but it'll be a better time to deal with that. But on the flip side, I think Boston would be better served in that matchup as opposed to say Atlanta or Chicago because they're not, I don't think they're really going to give them the respect that avoids them dropping a game that they shouldn't. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. And you have to stay very disciplined too with the, uh, Mm Foul free throw attempts that Joel Embiid can receive any given night, too. So that's something I think the Boston Celtics will definitely be working on and keep an eye on how to uh, get whistles and not be called for whistles since their bench depth isn't ideal. I mean, the starting five is one of the best probably offenses of this you know past decade, but uh, the bench starts to get a little bit questionable here. Um, quick thought before we move on to our first round thoughts, some breakout candidates and our favorites to come out the East or West. Uh, Charles Barkley telling Draymond Green, enjoy the play-in tournament months ago, then it happening and losing. Um, will Draymond Green and Charles Barkley be working together in the future, yes or no? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I can't wait for that moment to come back up, too, because Charles Barkley's got to let him hear about it. And uh, mm. I agree. All the old heads, man, the Draymond's, LeBron's, they're enjoying the play-in a little too much, man. <laughs> uh, look at the young ones up in there. Uh, but before we get to this side of the NBA, it is the countdown has begun. It is 100 days to the Olympics, and Summer Olympics will be in Paris this year. You can tune in on NBC and Peacock to see the greatest athletes in the world go for gold in the city of light. I'll be excited to watch that. The Olympic basketball team is actually star-studded, in my opinion. Uh, about time, man, because if i got to wake up at 4 a.m. and watch Team USA lose one more basketball game, where I'm going to kick a chair or a desk or something. Uh, I just want them to take the World Cup as seriously as they do the Olympics. That's the issue. Like, it's not the talent. Because when you do stuff like this, I get why. You know, especially with FIBA changing the calendars so that the World Cup is one summer before the Olympics instead of two. It kind of makes the guys on last year's team look like scapegoats. Like, you know, I think the only holdover is Anthony Edwards from that team for good reason. But it's like, those other guys who commit, you know, to playing, they don't – it's unfortunate they didn't win, but they don't really deserve that kind of stigma that can come attached to it. So hopefully as some of these older guys who made the Olympic team kind of not really get phased out, but obviously Father Time is undefeated. But some of these younger guys, they can kind of get them to, like, commit to doing both. Or you get FIBA to go back to the old calendar. That would be preferable in my opinion just because – it's difficult to ask guys to commit two summers in a row. So you have almost two entirely different teams from one year to the next. No, Wasn't Halliburton on there too? too? Oh yeah. Yep. Halliburton is Kawhi well. Leonard. came off the bench. Kawhi did not go to the worlds though. I don't think. No, but he's a, uh, he's a guy I was going to note that uh, he's yeah, injured right now. Well. He's yeah. All right. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. He's got that coming up too. Yeah. Um, it's a lot, a lot on these yeah. athletes. I mean, that's one thing. It's, it's an important thing. I was probably going to write about it at some point, but we're sending an old ass squad over to Paris, <laughs> and you got to you got to think about it from a fancy perspective, man. Like, I got quite like 
I don't know, man. Like, yeah. that's not easy to play, you know, make a deep run in the playoffs, then go play in Paris and then come back and get ready for training camp. Like, I think we could see some of these vets like Kevin Durant and stuff like starting the season kind of slow or maybe mm -hmm. they they handle them a little bit differently because that's a lot of wear for a summer. Like you're not even getting a break, really. So um, I don't know. Like I was actually kind of surprised we're sending so many old heads. Like I get it. You want to win the gold. But like, come on, man, we got a lot of <laughs> star young players that we can send here that aren't Kevin Durant and LeBron James. And, you know, so uh, yeah. We better I mean, I'm all mm -hmm. I, I do want to see, you know, like Lebr the LeBron James and all of them go out one last time together, like that era yeah, of players. Yeah. For sure. But yeah. I do agree that we could see Bring in his first one. Too. I mean, we're getting, you know, Hallie Burton, Edwards, uh, Tatum's in there as well. Mm -hmm. you know, situations like yeah, Booker. But there's situations where a guy like Bam out of bio, um, you got who else on here? Um and beach I mean, going yeah. too. See, like in B, like bro, yeah. you, you know, like, like, but like, yeah. why, why is it like, in, come on, Joe, like, you just sprained <laughs> your head, like, you just had surgery, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. bro. And that, this isn't me talking as a Sixers guy. I'm just like, take yeah. your career. I don't know, man. Like, you don't need to play in the Olympics. Like, I guess, like, yeah, personally, it's... maybe that's a, a personal goal for him, and I'm all for that, but I just feel like it makes it's putting your longevity at risk mm -hmm. when it, you don't need to do it, right. Yeah. I don't know if the full yeah. Oh, go ahead, Vaughn. No, I was going to ask you guys each if there was one player that you'd like to see on this Olympic team that's a younger player. Do you guys have a specific guy, or is he already on the roster? I think my guy was Ant. He's already on the roster. I, I kind of wonder what his minutes are going to look like. Even the younger guys in general, like, do you play them more early on than as you get to the medal rounds in the tournament portion? Then you try to ramp it up a bit with the older guys and the guys who may have sketchy medical histories. Uh, so that's going to be something to watch for me. Um, but I think the men's basketball is going to be loaded this year. You think about Germany as the reigning world champions. Um, France, you got Wemby, you got Gobert, that roster. Canada. Canada. <laughs> I mean, that's just, Canada's going to be nice. Yeah. I don't even know if they've yeah. gone through all of like the, the Olympic qualifying tournaments to fill out those final spots, but – Slovenia, Luka Doncic, you know, Serbia with Jokic, you know, and all those guys. It, man, it's a good thing that the, the time difference isn't as severe as it was um, for the last Olympics. So in Tokyo, because, man, you, you're not going to want to miss those games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Dan, is there uh, anybody for you? You going to say Tyrese Maxey? I was just going to say Jalen Brunson. I, I feel mm -hmm. like he's – I think he's at a point now where – um, his ability to knock down threes, he's high IQ. He doesn't need to be selfish. Like, I think he's a, I don't know, he just looks like a USA type of player um, just by the way he leads a team. So, yeah, I think that he would just be a good locker room guy, even if he wasn't, you know, getting a handful of minutes there with that roster. There is uh, still another spot open for their pitch with Kawhi Leonard and Joel Embiid. Maybe not. Uh, the guy like that could definitely get into it. I would like to see Jalen Brunson on Team USA for sure. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I, I'm interested in De'Aaron Fox too. He didn't he didn't make it, Ooh, I um, love that. and not uh, not a guy that would make it this year, but maybe in a few years. My man, Cade Cunningham, uh, still interested to see if he could make it to a Team USA roster one day. Uh, but we need to see the Pistons win some more games first. Anyways, first it's on round, Monty. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's on more than Monty. Monty doesn't. It's on Troy Weaver. Get him out of there. He's busy. <laughs> um, First round thoughts. Is there a team that you guys like to pull off the upset that you say that is the team, or is there someone that has the potential? Rafael, I'll start with you. Um, I, I don't know about a first round upset, but I feel like Orlando is someone who could potentially make a run. I know it, it, in terms of tradition, you like teams tend to have to crawl before they walk in terms of the playoffs. You know, you may get yeah. bounced in the first round or something but i think orlando potentially um could be someone they get by cleveland i'm not i used i tried to believe in cleveland earlier this season but like down the stretch <laughs> I, I don't know if i, I can, tried yeah, i don't know if i can do that at this point um they're still trying to too big experiment you know which has its moments but i think it's still a bit awkward in terms of how it fits offensively so I think Orlando would be someone. I don't know if that wouldn't qualify as a first round upset, but 
Second is. round against Boston, you know, you never know. I'm just trying not to pick the Knicks as like the team would be ripe for an upset because they're going to be the pick, they're going to be the trendy pick of everyone, I think. So, yeah, I think the uh, the trendiest pick probably right now is the Indiana Pacers to beat the Bucks. Yeah, since Giannis mm-hmm. will probably miss mm-hmm. a game or two. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I'm quite there. I like the Cavaliers to beat the Magic because I just think the Cavs, who haven't made a second round since LeBron James was on the team, uh, that first round exit last year is definitely going to be incentive. And they tanked on Sunday, which helped out my wallet. But they tanked against the Hornets in order to uh, secure a better matchup, in their opinion, with the Magic. So I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm not to me. (laughs) I won, it, I won yeah. thousands of dollars. I was so happy. Hey, I was like, oh, hey, my God, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm cool, but I just feel like, like they're saying on ESPN, the basketball gods may not like, you know, kind of pulling the plug and tanking as they did and as we saw Milwaukee do in Orlando on Sunday. So I, yeah. It's the NBA nowadays, if you got to get the best matchup possible for some of these Run teams through the that. tape. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, who do you like? Um, who do you think I get the upset in the first round? I already talked about it, man. I'm telling you, Sixers over the Knicks in the first round. It's happening. That's <laughs> going to be the upset. Um, but no, I think uh, I'm curious what you said, Vaughn, because like I, I do think that there is a, a huge question mark around Giannis Antetokounmpo. Can he get back by like game three? If he doesn't. I don't know, man. What depth does the Bucks ha- do? The Bucks have that gives you confidence that they can not only keep pace with the Pacers, pun intended, but um, beat them. Like, I I don't think that the – now that they got Siakam in there, man, like they're going to play better defense. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're just going to be able to walk over them like and assume it's like, okay, it's the Bucs, they're three seed. And it's also like, let's not forget who the coach of the the Milwaukee Bucks is, Mr. I don't adjust for anything for anybody, Doc Rivers. So, Glenn Rivers. So, I don't know, man. I'm Mm -hmm. kind of feeling you in the public there, man. I might be rocking with the Pacers, um, even if the Sixers – so – Assuming the Sixers do win tonight on Wednesday, they're beating the Knicks, and then the Pacers I'll have probably taken down the Bucks. And Raph, yours is a kind of an upset because the Magic are a five seed. So yeah, that that's good. that's my thing. Like you look at the seeds, what really constitutes an upset? Like if Phoenix were to beat Minnesota, we really saying that's an upset just because Phoenix right. was a six. You know, I think it's they're one of those years where. To win that series. Yeah, so I guess Minnesota <laughs> winning would make would be an upset if you wanted to go that route. So it's like so many of these teams with like the star pedigree are kind of lower seated. So it's like pick an upset. Does it really constitute an upset in that regard? Yeah, so. no, I, and you look at the what you know Vegas says is the upset, and a lot of the seeds that are the lower seeds are actually the ones that are favored, like the Mavericks yeah. or the Clippers. They are also favored. The Pacers right now to some places are favored to beat the Bucks in the series or it's even money. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, it's an interesting scenario seeing the seedings and not thinking, like, that's not really an upset, the Mavericks being the Clippers. Like, the Mavericks have been the better team over the last 30 games. Um, and, you know, we talked about the Timberwolves how many times this year, but we talked about the Suns too. But I think I'll still take their big three, uh, the Suns' big three of Booker, Bill, and KD uh, in that series. and. They've also beat the Timberwolves every single game they've seen. So I think game one, Timberwolves throw that kitchen sink out there. They throw everything they have at them. But the Suns are probably the team that advances there. So I would probably say the Pacers, best bet to be an upset. Uh, but I might not be saying much anymore because we've hated the Bucks all season. Well, I've hated the Bucks all season. So do you feel like it's <laughs> gone too far to an extent? Or are you just – Factoring in, like, if you don't have Giannis That's, for three for potentially two, three games, like, you got to. I think out the Bucks could survive with a, without a game or two without Giannis. Like, if it's one to one and you're getting Giannis in game three, I feel like the Bucks, mm-hmm. like, that, I'm playing the right. Bucks. I'm taking the Bucks right. to win that right. series. Um, but I just felt like anybody that played defense was going to be able to take down the Bucks. And they got a team that's going to want to run up and down the floor and shoot threes just like them. So that gives Milwaukee an opportunity. And not saying Damon Lillard's washed up any means. He's had a down season by what he does, MVP caliber type player. But this is a spot in the next two games. Like, Dame, you should be putting up. Yeah. He's got to be putting up numbers. And uh, maybe it's the groin injury that he had at the end of the season or whatever. But, um, hey, we got got a new set of of circumstances now. It's playoff Mm -hmm. time. So this is usually Dame time. 
it's unfortunate that he's not going to have his star player. Like this is same situation as Portland, right? <laughs> he's got to put the team on his back, mm -hmm. but that's yeah. what he does. That's why they got him. So we'll see what it do. And there's probably going to be someone that steps up alongside him in Milwaukee to see him. Obviously, Grace Allen, Portis. Bobby Portis. Uh, Bobby Portis is actually on the list for uh, – Eastern Conference MVP, he's the last option to be bet out of the top 15, which shocked really? me. But he should get an increase. He's been playing great. He, yeah. Like, Doc Rivers unlocked him, actually. Like, he's been a, a great fantasy player for the end of the season. It's the key um, to Doc Rivers keeping his job, Bobby Portis. Uh, but <laughs> on a serious note, Raphael, who's a, a breakout candidate for you, whether it's Eastern or Western Conference? For me, it's Paolo Bancaro. Um, reigning rookie of the year, earned his first All-Star game appearance this year as well. Like four games against Cleveland, average 23, uh, 6.3 boards, 3.8 assists. I think the issue for him, whether it be fantasy or actual basketball, has long been turnovers. Um, against Cleveland, average 4.3 turnovers per game this season, 3.1 per game on the season as a whole. So that's kind of why he's a better player for eight cat in totals than he is for nine cat formats in terms of fantasy. But I think he's someone that, the strides he's made from year one to year two at this point, I believe he can be a difference maker in that first round series. Then you're potentially looking at Boston in the second round. I think he's someone who could be a breakout candidate in the postseason, at least for me. Yeah, if they do make it to the second round, Porzingis versus Paula would be an absolute fire matchup to mm -hmm. watch those two bigs go at it. And I do agree. I think Bencaro has taken a step forward next year. He'll be a guy that everyone's going to be targeting their fantasy yeah. drafts. Dan, who's uh, your breakout candidate for this postseason? I think it's going to be Jalen Williams, J-Dub. I think he's going to yeah. be that X factor for the Thunder. Like, we already know what SGA can do. Chet Holmgren will certainly have his mark on the on the, on the the game and in the playoffs. But I think Jalen Williams is going to have the responsibility to guard arguably the best players on both teams. I mean, if you're looking at the – Eight seed, you know, you're looking at someone like uh, he's probably going to be on Darren Fox quite a bit if they get there. Pel if they play the Pelicans, it's probably going to be, you know, Trey Murphy or, if, you know, Zion's probably not going to be healthy by then. But, Ingram. Um, yeah. Ingram. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then you go to the next seed. If they go on, you know, what I'm saying you're going to be facing one of the Clippers or the Mavericks. Like he's definitely going up against Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Luka Doncic. Like this guy's going to be key on the perimeter. So. I think we're going to get to see a guy that's a key in a 3D position and, and also take a substantial leap offensively. Man, this dude averaged almost 20 points per game, five rebounds, five assists. He's very underrated, and I think he's going to really start – this is where we're going to start to see the breakout and people actually talking about him being like a, a next up-and-coming player and star in this league. Yeah, I like that play a lot. You can do an all-around 25-5, and five, not a bad option for a breakout candidate. Mine was corny. I'm not going to lie, because he's, he's already broke out this year. It was uh, Tyrese Halliburton finally getting the playoffs. And I was just figured if if someone's going to be shocking and put up 25 and 12 over the course of a series, and you'll say, I can't believe he did that, Tyrese Halliburton's probably the guy that mm -hmm. didn't during the regular season, but can do that in the playoffs too, in my opinion. So I'm hoping that he can continue his breakout season and just do it in the playoffs, averaging you know 25 and 12, something like that against the Bucks. I think is very – a tano pool for him. So that was uh, my pick. But like I said, I don't, uh, I don't really think that's a bad pick, to be honest with you, because yeah. his production yeah, dropped off a bit after that hamstring injury when they rushed yeah. him back. So I and think. I, I did see one of the worst things of the season for somebody. Um, Tyrese yeah. Halliburton finished with 24.9 points per game. Um, you were able to take him on the sports books at, will he have 25 points per game or more this season? Uh, oh, so man. actually that second half start, yeah, lost a lot of people money um, mm. at the very end. So uh, let's make it back on him. But I, I think that uh, he could just – he's going to be a household name here pretty soon. And yeah. now that the Indiana Fever got Caitlin Clark, uh, yeah. that Cindy is really up and popping when it comes to uh, the stardom in basketball. Uh, but as we spoke on, it seems like the favorites, Boston and Denver, everyone keeps talking about to come out the East and the West. Can anyone beat them, Raphael? Are you taking anyone to knock off Boston or Denver? I'm not taking anyone, but I don't think that these teams are bulletproof either, uh, especially Denver. Like We've seen how competitive the West has been all season long. Um, I really like the way that the Mavericks have played this year. Now, getting Derek Lively back will help kind of fortify that center position behind Daniel Gafford. P.J. Washington's looked like a different player since he arrived there. Um, Kyrie and Luka, how do you guard both of those guys? Like I think that's going to be the other thing. 
Um, so I think of the two favorites, Denver probably has a better chance of being upset just because of the strength of the conference that they're in. But it's going to be difficult to beat both of those teams. Yeah, absolutely agreed. I think uh, Boston is the Eastern Conference champion. I took that a while ago and felt confident in it, but the Western mm -hmm. Conference is pretty hard for me to pick, Dan, because I like the Thunders route at the one seed. I think they can knock off the Mavericks if that's who they face. I think the Nuggets can knock off the Suns or the Wolves. Um, but I don't want to go chalk one or two. So what do you like in the East and the West? I actually feel like the Boston Celtics are going to be the most vulnerable on the uh, comparing the two teams. Um, as Raph pointed out before, man, even if they get out to a, a comfortable lead, they have these moments of playing with their food and like Jalen Brown, Mr. No Left Hand. I don't know. I feel like there's going to be moments where we'll see him kind of disappear and then they'll go revert back to watching Jason Tatum play iso ball. That's not the formula that works traditionally. And if you look at Jaden, Jason Tatum in the clutch, not the best performer. And Chris Porzingis has to prove that he can stay healthy for a substantial amount of time. And he hasn't – He they monitored his injuries well throughout the season, but this is the playoffs. It's a different grind. It's a different expectation. Um, I don't know, man. I think that there's a – as much as I think the Sixers can beat the Knicks, if they don't, I think the Knicks pose a threat. I think that there's a bunch of teams that can pose a threat, honestly. If they just hit – they hit the the – I feel like the Boston Celtics aren't safe enough because they just play around too much. And mm -hmm. I don't know there's holes in their game, but the Nuggets, they have proven that they can do it. If they get the right path. I just see that they're going to be way harder to beat, just being that they already have that championship pedigree. And uh, man, Jokic and the, their squad is just too good. If Jamal Murray is healthy and they got that pick and roll action, like you're not, you're not stopping it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but health I, uh, is going to there's always going to be these random injuries throughout the playoffs, man. Like it's it's going to come down to health and and where this where everyone kind of ends up. But like I feel like it's probably going to end up being Boston in the Nuggets. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely the most likely outcome to happen. Um, but I think that which uh, you made a point on right now, I think the Knicks and the Sixers are the two biggest threats to take off. the that knocked off the Celtics. I would not take Cleveland, Orlando, Milwaukee or Indiana to beat Boston. Um, I'm not going to waste my time on Chicago or Atlanta, but uh, I think that both your two favorite teams are definitely the two teams that would give them a seven game series, play physical defense and have the star power at two very important positions. And on the West, I think if I was taking a ticket on a long shot, it'd probably be the Mavericks. Um, Cause if the Mavericks beat the Clippers who haven't looked great, you get the Thunder who are young, lesser and experienced team. Um, and, you know, most surprising one seed since the Hawks 10 years ago. Uh, and then you got, you know, that's a good matchup for Luka Doncic to finally make his first Western Conference uh, Finals appearance. Hey, he's been there Western before. Conference. He's um, been in the finals. Been, yeah, the um, year they blew out the Suns in game seven. That's they lost right. the Warriors in 22. That's right. Yeah. I um, The Mavericks got blown out, correct, by like 50-something? No, the Suns. The Mavericks Suns blew out the Suns. Yeah. And then the they lost the, all, the Warriors. Uh, yeah. They all walked them. Oh, yeah. got you. Okay. Yeah. That's. That's where my I, I remember was, where I was when that happened. Saying, I was like, yo, yeah. how is this? This is. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. I'm not going to go on my Twitter timeline, but I definitely took the Suns in that game. Um, that's where I was talking about earlier. Uh, shut up, Dan. All right. So uh, now that we uh, we covered those, um, any lasting thoughts you guys want to get out there for uh, anybody next year in fantasy or the NBA playoffs before we get out of here? Rafael, I'll start with you. Um, I think. It's just going back to the Warriors, kind of keeping an eye on what they do in free agency, uh, just because I believe that someone like a Trace Jackson Davis or a Jonathan Kaminga even could be a potential breakout candidate, not like an elite fantasy player, but someone who can be a lot better than where you'll likely draft them um, in, in, in the even standard leagues. So I think keep an eye on what they do in free agency with like a Clay Thompson or how they even strengthen that, look to strengthen that roster with what little money they have left over in terms of the cap and the aprons. But um, yeah, I think those are the guys I'm kind of watching, you know, in these next few months. Yeah. Certainly Clay Thompson is going to be, uh, you know, not the best player in the off season to be on the market, but probably the biggest name as far as uh, what intriguingness uh, we'll have around him, I guess I should say, if that's a word, I don't know. Dan, uh, your lasting thoughts. I'm with Raft in the fact that I think, and this also applies to you, Vaughn, I think Jonathan Kaminga is going to be up for most improved player next year. 
Yes. When he sees 30 minutes, 21 points, six boards, three assists, I think that he could easily ramp that up to higher than that if he gets 30 plus, you know, 32, 33 minutes a night, plays out the way, some other things change. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. And if he if he can get to that status, he's gonna be definitely a you know top 90 pick next year. Yeah, love that. What are you smirking about Raphael? I know you feel like you're gonna make fun of somebody. No, but no, no. This is something I just saw on Twitter. I don't want to talk about it on the air though. So. All right, and I'll say my uh, my one thing to say before we get out of here: the Chicago Bulls will have the worst record in the NBA next year because uh, we're going to be selling, selling, Oof. selling in the off season. So I'm finally going to hit that one and uh, be right on my favorite team. So appreciate you guys as always. Make sure you check out Dan and Raphael's work at Yahoo Sports and NBC Sports for the upcoming NBA playoffs. My work will also be on NBC Sports. And thank you, Adam, for always holding us down backstage as our producer. For everyone checking out the Road Road Basketball Show, enjoy the games, enjoy the NBA, and we'll see you next week.